Are you searching for teaching aids to inspire your budding primary scientists? Well, today on Resource Review, we're going to be looking at three that you might want to consider. A body organs tunic. What's something that Ellie has done, do you think, to be unhealthy? A method of teaching using puppets. Good morning, Year 3. Good morning, Jasmine. And some scale selectors. What will our panel of experts think? Well, to find out, keep watching Resource Review. <laughs> Recommending today's resources is former head teacher John Stringer, now turned primary science consultant. Joining John, we have Alan Howe, a senior lecturer in primary science education at Bath Spa University. And we also have Colin Hinson, an independent educational consultant. John, let's start with the organ tunic. Now, there are others yes. on the market. Um, this does look rather wonderful, though, but why this one? Well, this is an area that can get over-taught. What happens is that teachers can get into too much detail and depth with this, and I think this aid just about works at the right level. It's not as elaborate as those big torsos you can get, nor is it as, as straightforward and perhaps as, as confusing as, as, as a flat two-dimensional picture can be. So here we've got something in three dimensions. You can handle the pieces, see their relative sizes, how they overlap and belong in the body, without getting into something that's too far beyond what's covered by curriculum requirements. Thanks, John. To get to the heart of the matter and see how the organ tunic performs in the classroom, we visited teacher Ian MacDonald and his Key Stage 2 class. Jessica, you ready? Right, OK, everyone. As you know, we've been looking recently at the human body and we've been thinking about, in particular, the internal organs of the human body. This morning we've been using the organ tunic in our science lesson and we've been using that to revise where the internal organs are in the body. Catherine, if you can come up because you're going to help your team, they're going to help you position the organs inside the body. So if you'd like to come up. And we had a little competition to see which half of the classroom could get those organs in the correct place on the tunic and label them correctly. Lungs, heart, liver, stomach, kidneys. We then as a class talked okay, through the, the functions side. of each of the major internal organs um, in the body. The kidneys here and here to the side. For the main part of the lesson, we changed the, what, the healthy organs in, in one of the tunics to unhealthy organs and we talked through healthy and unhealthy lifestyles. What's something that Ellie has done, do you think, to be unhealthy? I think it's a very good resource for both visual and kinesthetic learners. They actually can have a go at coming up, feeling what the organs are like if they are damaged, the, the, the lumps and the tumours that can be caused by smoking and, and alcohol. Sorry, light, please, on this half. The resource that, that came with it was just a, a, a worksheet that you could use with the children. It might have been quite nice, although it would, would put the cost up, to maybe have something like a CD-ROM that could link in with, with the tunic and, and go into a bit more depth, maybe looking inside the, the organs, for example, looking inside the lungs and, and seeing actually when the lungs become blackened, what it looks like inside the lung. The, the children really benefit from using the resource because it is something different. H having used them, I can't see that there are any bad points at all, really, with the, with the tunics. It may be that perhaps with, with younger children, the tunics may be a little bit too large for them, but, but apart from that, they, they were a very good resource to use and something I know the children enjoyed using. John, a positive uh, review from the teacher there who made use of the alternative set of organs, the unhealthy set that yes. you can buy for an extra cost. What's your view on that? I've got very mixed feelings about these and I think it's down to professional judgment. I wouldn't be happy to use these with children, for example, whose parents were heavy smokers because I think right. there's this anxiety they would have about uh, what's actually happened to my parents' lungs, what's happening to their internal organs if I know they drink heavily. So I would have be in two minds about this and they should be treated with some sensitivity. It's this I like. 
not necessarily this. Okay. Alan, what's, what are your thoughts on the organ tunic? I think younger children will have great fun dressing up and, and putting those things on, maybe playing, maybe some role play <laughs> can be imagined in the, the role call mm. where, where children can perform operations on each other. I don't know, it could be a bit gruesome, <laughs> but it might be quite good fun. But I think once children start to focus on the, on the knowledge that they, they, they need at Key Stage 2, then that's, that's when the, uh, the resource will come into its own. Colin, what are your thoughts? Well, the re one of the reasons I really, really love this uh, as, a, as a teaching resource is because, as the teacher said, it, it hits different learning styles. You know, you could be a visual learner or a kinesthetic learner or whatever it happens to be mm -hmm. because it's participatory, because it's interactive and because, you know, the children are actually taking part rather than just being passive observers. Mm -hmm. It makes it a, a wonderful resource for this particular subject. OK, now what about uh, actually it, as a physical resource? Alan, I mean, it, it's, it's it's fairly durable. It's about 70, 80 pounds for the basic set. Um, is it a good investment? I think so. I think it would last a number of years and see a number of groups of children through uh, their science education. I think one of the things that I would like to see uh, uh, in terms of the teaching resources to go with it would be maybe starting to think about uh, ways in which it's not the same as the human body and getting children to think about the fact that we're, we're not full of nice, soft, uh, <laughs> fluffy parts. But there are some differences as well. And perhaps if we looked at the heart, looking at uh, different models uh, as well. So it'd be a good starting point. Well, thank you all very much. Now let's move on to John's second choice of resource. And I have to say, this is something a little bit different for primary science. Yeah. It is the Puppets Project, mm -hmm. using our little friends here. John, tell us about this resource. Well, this is bringing together two areas of education that I think are interesting. One is the use of puppets, which has a long and unworthy history. And the other is the business of discussion, conversation, the use of language in science. Uh, it encourages more discussion of reasoning rather than discussion of just events that have taken place. And that it actually is quite a support for a teacher who's not so confident with science. OK, thank you. Well, let's see how our little friends got on in the classroom. We went up to Cheshire and visited Goose Tree Primary School, where teacher Adam Winfield introduced a new assistant to his primary science class. Good morning, Year 3. Good morning, Jasmine. I bet you're thinking, science, oh, <laughs> lots of writing. But not today. I've got a <laughs> treat for you. My friend, Kim. We got a slide at the weekend. Mr Winfield saved up and he bought us all a slide. We had a science lesson this morning where we wanted to see what surfaces make uh, people or something go down a slide more quickly or more slowly. What I would like you to do, so this acts like a slide, would you lift up the back of the slide till they start sliding down? When everyone broke off, to do their own experiments, I actually provided them with a puppet of their own to actually try and lead their activity. So I thought if they had a puppet, then they might ask themselves questions by asking the puppet the actual questions, so then they can answer it and find out more information. When you put the sponge on the slide, it makes, them, it, makes it go slower. Because I've never used them before, and it's something they've never used in a classroom before, it, it was a really good novelty, a wow factor really for them. If it's not used too often, then it's a surprise when they walk through the door, very first thing, and I think that's what sometimes they need on some mornings. You'll be a really good group to help me with my science, and because I love slides so much, you're going to do this for me, you're going to help me. I think that uh, these puppets could be used in other subjects, um, music, even in PE. I would say anything really, having practical work anyway, tends to make them very happy. So I think for the start, it's probably a good part. Well, John, the puppets seem to go down very well. They're fun, they're innovative, but do they detract from the lesson content, which is essentially primary science, not sort of drama and role play. I don't think any more than using pictures or books or any other medium would. The issue is um, how you use them. And it's interesting to see that he actually gave the puppets over to the children to use them so they could express their opinions. And they might feel that little bit more confidence as we all do when we're wearing one, some kind of mask, which is what the puppets are rather like. So how much support is given to teachers who want to embark on the Puppet Project? The Puppet, the puppet Project is developing support. There is a website that you can go to and pick up information. There's research going on at present and there will be further products including a, a CD-ROM and, and a book. At this point uh, there are 
good common sense rules and they're available on their website. Okay, thank you very much. Colin, what about um, the cross-curricular applications of the, the puppets? I mean, if, if you can use puppets for science, presumably you can use them in any other class. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, I think one of the problems with that is if you're using the same set of puppets for science and then the next lesson, well, not the next lesson necessarily, but another lesson, you're then using them for sort of literacy work or history or something, I think the kids will automatically recognise the fact that it's a science puppet that's now being used for, for history as well. So you'll have to have a variety of puppets in order to do right. that. <laughs> well, Alan, sticking to science, mm. what do you think of the puppets? But well, I think that gets really to the heart of something that's very important about primary science, which is, is talk and discussion. And as they, we saw in the clip earlier on, the, the puppet saying, oh, it's not going to be more writing. I think what science should be about is talking and doing hands-on and minds-on. And so I think these puppets might give children a real opportunity to say what they think. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Now let's move on to John's third choice of resource. Doesn't look quite so exciting, John. It's these scale selectors but possibly just as important? <laughs> Do you yes. want to tell us about them? Yeah, this is a cool tool. This is something you can use that's going to make a difference in the classroom if you're trying to teach children how to produce graphs. And the idea of this is that if all of us who've done graphs with children in the class will know that one of the big issues is how do you choose the scales to go on the axes? Now, I have one here I prepared, it, prepared earlier to give an example of this. Because these scale selectors are have a large number of separate scales on them. There's also there's a teacher version this size, and there's a child version, which is this size, and obviously a child can take their own. But I've put one together here with just two of the scales on to show the way in which it can be used. What happens when children make their own scales very often is either they make the scales too small, in which case the graph is crowded into the corner, or they make it too large, in which case they ask you for sellotape to stick more paper onto the top of the paper. <laughs> uh, and we don't want either of those. We want a graph that tells a clear and accurate story. And doing these, using these, it can. Well, Alan, what do you think of these? So I think probably the most important thing is that we construct graphs as quickly as possible and move on to discussing what graphs can tell us. Mm. And so I think if, it, if, if that helps uh, children to construct those graphs efficiently and, and then to, look on to, uh, to move on to looking at the, the meaning of, of the data that they've collected, okay. I think that's a good thing. I mean, Colin, they are, they are nicely laminated, um, but this is something that a teacher could presumably just make themselves. Uh, yes, I think I think it can, but they're very professionally produced, and uh, you know they do look nice. And so, teachers are time poor. You know they don't have a great deal of time to put stuff together themselves. And if there's resources out there that they can buy in that does the same job, then then so be it. Well, thank you all very much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. But to recap, the three resources that we looked at were the organ tunic, an unhealthy organ set from Philip Harris Educational a range of hand puppets from Millgate House Publishing and Consultancy Limited, and finally, scale selectors, available from TTS Group Limited. For more information about any of the resources that we've looked at today, and to post your own comments about other resources for primary science, go to our website. It's teachers.tv forward slash resource review. Or if you want to, email us, resourcereview at teachers.tv. A very big thank you to our panel for today, to John, to Alan and to Colin. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on Resource Review. Bye-bye. <laughs>